um, at different points as well. So we, so when you're looking at who is my customer and what do they need, you really need to get down to a micro level in that way. Because that needs to be translated through online, the website and email marketing as well? Most definitely. It comes back to um, Wendy's comments to start with. She said, uh, you know, the old the old sales model was, here's the presentation. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll start with product A and we'll end with service Z. <laughs> and if necessary, I'll start again because you didn't get it somehow. <laughs> so gone are the days of, um, you know, the effectiveness of mass media or mass marketing. Because we, I mean, we're looking at a gener generation of the, the younger generation who is, we want it, we want it now, we want to know it right now. Mm -hmm. We can Google it, if your website doesn't have it, it will go somewhere else in a split second. Mm, and the, even the new generation is, is interesting because not only do they want, we want it, we want it now, it's we want to interact with it. Yep. So um, there's, there's various, uh, I guess, degrees as well of, of how your website would interact with each of those customer groups also. But it comes back to, it comes back to identify if this is customer group A, and let's split that customer group into new um, and existing for sake of simplicity, then they will have different needs, they will require different services or different products. And so therefore, when we want to sell online, and certainly in email communications, they're only interested in that. <laughs> you know, I don't care about all the other products and services you have right now. I mean, it's great that you've got them and I might tap into them later. But right now, this is my need. Uh, this is what I need to hear about. And what happens with websites, or what has happened with websites up until recently, is that um, it's, this is my company, this is where we're situated, this is the products that we have. It's the presentation. <laughs> And they're real exciting websites to look at, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they are. And, um, and so they're talking to everybody and hoping that anybody will come and um, pick up the phone or be a genuine inquiry. And, um, you know, we know for a fact that 95, or probably more, percent of websites um, have zero or close to zero conversion. So if you ask most business owners, you know, what is your website doing for you? I'd say, well, you know, it's up there and it's, um, you know, it's not really doing a lot. <laughs> and if I said, how many inquiries did you get in the last year? How many sales did you make from that website? Well, we've got, you know, we had a few inquiries, two were tire kickers and one was, <laughs> you know. And it's not very often. That's not to say that, you know, some people don't have dynamic websites and they're not working for them. But on the whole, I think the stat is 95%. Yeah. So what what do we need to do to obviously get sales through our websites? I mean, we've looked at, I guess, segmenting the customers, making sure the information's relevant. Not too much information at the same time. It's, it's a bit of both. Um, the way that the content, uh, it, the best practice for content presentation on the website is to cater to two types of people. Um, one is the skimmers, the people who skim. I mean, to, if you think about your own experience on the web, you see a site, you're sometimes sceptical <laughs> when you're looking at it. What, what, what's in it for me? What's this person going to tell me, um, you know, really? What, what, what is there that I can benefit from? And so you quickly skim through. If there's no headlines and lots of them and, and um, you know, graphics that anchor your attention but not too many to distort the, the message, um, you know, you're not really catering to those skimmers and most web readers are skimmers. But the people who buy are the readers. <laughs> so you've got to attract them with the headlines. You've got to have lots of that stuff around. Um, and then that encourages them to read further. So it's the same as the newspaper. Why do, do I have a great headline? So that the person will read the subhead. <laughs> and why is the subhead really 
you know, really great, is to get them to read the next paragraph and so on. Yeah. So get them engaging in the process. Mm. Now remember we had Chris Hewson on the panel who's worked with um, BMW and other large companies on marketing. He said one of the greatest issues business owners do or typically do is that there are too many competing elements in their advertising campaign. So they've got too many pictures, too many headlines, too much text. Now that translated onto a website, people are just going to click off, aren't they? Mm, too much, uh, I mean, you need to be graphically engaged, people are quite visual, um, but the headlines need to really stand out and speak to you. So um, if we take a, a, a company that I've been working with recently, um, they are a pest control company. And, um, you know, when you go and have a look at their website, it, but it looks like they're talking to businesses, businesses who need pest control, whereas the majority of their customer, um, you know, or custom, if you like, the money <laughs> and the people are homeowners. And if you think about the person who rings up and says, I need my house sprayed, it's generally a woman. <laughs> and it's generally a woman between the ages of... Well, I mean, it's a broad range, but the core group will be 30 to 45. And there's generally kids or pets that they're concerned about, and is the product toxic, <laughs> and all of these questions. So if I, as a mum, and a concerned mum, comes to this website and it looks like it's for big business or businesses, then I'll probably leave that site and go and find one which looks more domestic. Um, so that's the importance of identifying who is your ideal prospect, who is your target customer, and creating the website in a way that when they look at it, it speaks to them. And tell us about how, I guess, what element do your autoresponders play in the sales of, you know, through the website? For those of you who don't know what an autoresponder is, Someone registers their details on the website, the website then sends out an automated email. So what kind of part does that play? It, um, well, that's linked in with data collection and there are websites and there are websites and um, you know, the websites evolve where HTML, you have to get a developer to change any content, um, change the graphics out, um, you know, any change you wanted to make. Whereas, you know, more and more and eventually all websites will be some form of content management system where you have the ability to go in and, and change the data. Now, most content management systems or, or what I would call superior technology has a database that drives the thing. And why does it do that? Because your website is a marketing tool. It's not an IT tool, it's a marketing tool. And marketing is all about demographics, psychographics, who's coming, when did they leave, um, what did they do when they were here, um, what are the ages, what customer group, so on and so forth. So by collecting data and then being able to use that, we can then use that in, in email communications or auto responses or uh, dynamic pages, for example. Um, so that the content on the site and the content in your email only speaks to that person about that particular interest. It reflects need. directly to what they currently need. I mean, then this data can be used for the sales process on the phone. Absolutely. The website is a marketing tool. It delivers, it should work to deliver the customer to your sales process. Yep. So tell us about AdWords campaign. You had an example of an AdWords campaign that you ran. Okay, this is the, yes, all right. <laughs> um, this one was, was quite interesting. It was quite another fun one. <laughs> so I'm trying, I'm trying to make the IT not so, not so boring. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> so um, there's a company uh, called Geological Nuclear Sciences and uh, they crunch a lot of data because of seismic data. <laughs> and um, anyway, they we had to find what translates to a supercomputer to crunch this process, uh, crunch this data. And um, where to digital, coming back to our Lord of the Rings story, 
um, of course, have New Zealand's largest supercomputer because they had to create all of those animations and special effects. And when they're not using it in production, this thing just sits there, which is kind of a bit redundant, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, we, we got this computer and, um, and worked it for this company, and then we thought, right, well, that's really interesting. Why don't we take it to the States where there was a big expo of oil and gas companies who have similar requirements. And um, anyway, this is a massive expo event and Geological Nuclear Sciences, if by US terms, is probably a tiny little company that has got nothing to do with oil and gas. <laughs> but anyway, they, they set up, what we did was we got a um, collectible statue that was signed by Richard Taylor, who won the Academy Awards for the special effects in Lord of the Rings. So he gave us this Lord of the Rings collectible statue. And we ran an AdWords campaign. And the campaign appeared when you searched for the Oil and Gas Expo. <laughs> and what we did was we said, well, if you link to our site and you give us your details, and uh, you'll go into this drawer. And the drawer's going to be held at the Expo at our stand at 3 o'clock on Saturday. Because that's when it was going to be the most packed. So, anyway, at 3 o'clock on Saturday, there was a massive crowd <laughs> around this uh, little tiny company's, well, it's not a little tiny company, really, uh, but, but around this company's expo stand. Meanwhile, BP and Shell and the others are going, oh, what's going on over there? <laughs> so, they walked out of that expo, as you can imagine, with um, a massive amount of leads um, and so on. So, it's all about thinking a little bit laterally. Uh, thinking about the opportunities, thinking about who the connectors might be. Um, you know, what is it? What is it that your people want? Sometimes it's just simply a bit of fun. You know, we're sick to death of being marketed to. <laughs> you know, um, we see it coming, don't we? <laughs> and so, you know, actually, um, is anyone up for one more little story? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, just a, just another quick story. One. This is a services company here in Australia. And they have um, large clients, Coca-Cola and, and others, uh, big notables. And um, anyway, we, we were talking about, this is actually the client's um, idea. <laughs> and he thought, you know, I, I want to put something really funny up on the website, just, just, just for a bit of humour. Because we can, we can tailor the pages to known customers and, and visitors, so the visitors wouldn't see this. Um, only, only the people that are on the database. So anyway, I thought, okay, yeah, that might be that might be worth a go. All right, fair enough. You just want to give give your you know your customers a bit of light humour. Well, it had such a viral effect. <laughs> this particular piece, this video, and it was of this um, footballer who they you install in your office, and he tackles everybody who does something wrong in the office, who's lazy or has a Everyone needs positions. one of them. <laughs> I think he was called Terry something, I can't remember, anyway. Um, but it was so funny that, that people were sending their friends to go and have a look at this thing. So as a result of this particular funny video, they ended up getting quotes and referrals off the back of it, and it wasn't even a sales campaign. It was just to provide a bit of light humour to the customers to say, hey, we appreciate you. There you go. What do you think of that one? Pretty good. good. So we need to really be thinking outside of the box in terms of our marketing, because, I mean, the marketing initiates the sales process. It does, and it's and it comes back to just like with the sales process, rapport, rapport, rapport. I mean, people aren't going to buy from you if they don't like you. I mean, that's that's. I think that's rule number one with sales. And it's very hard to get an online customer to like you. I mean, it's almost you know an oxymoron, isn't it? But you can do it. You can do it with data, with the, with the database and changing. Uh, content. Why? Because you like the sites that are actually really helpful to you, don't you? The ones that go out of their way to provide you with, you know, those little bits extra? That it's not all about their product and their service. So we, we need to look at the personality of the website in an essence as well. 
Most definitely. Who are you targeting? You know, I mean, again, if mums are your mums are your target market, probably not <laughs> in this instance. But we've got an, another company that does snap frozen foods, and who buys that? Well, the mum does. So, what are mums interested in? They're interested in convenience. Desperate housewives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it the poor boy the mum's like? <laughs> interested in convenience, they're actually the harshest critics online as well, the mums, but um, anyway, they're interested in valuable information, give me value, <laughs> you know, I've got time, <laughs> just give me some value, so nutritional tips, you know, a meal plans, those types of things that have got nothing to do with snack frozen food, but are in the realm of that mindset when you're on the site, so it's going a little bit broader. There's a, there's a huge shift that is, if you look at the biggest companies around Australia and overseas, there's a huge shift with the biggest companies supplying informational resources on their website. Like you said, recipes. I think it's Kellogg's have got recipes on their site as well now. I know there's also a heap of other brands that are doing that as well. And this is, um, you know, one, one part of the online environment can, that can really help businesses um, in the offline world is the search engine optimization, excuse me, um, search engine optimization, you know, because that helps you identify what, what, what is the psyche of people that are searching for the products and services such as I offer. What, are, what do they want? Well, you've actually got real data, haven't you? You've got, you've got, you've got an ability to find out exactly what it is they want. Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. Now we'll take a couple of quick questions. Does anyone have a question for our panelists? Anyone? Yep. The, the figure you mentioned earlier about 95%. I mean, the first step is what you just alluded to, the search engine optimization. where probably a lot of websites fail because they're not on the first page of Google or something like that. Um. And then it comes to the presentation of the website. Most definitely. It is the first step. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And um, <laughs> But what most people do wrong with search engine optimization is that they go, hmm, I'm a business broker. So what would people search for? <coughs> business broking, you know, it doesn't get a lot more extravagant than that. Oh, I have my company name in there. We're in um, Melbourne, we'll have that in there. Uh, business consultancy, business consulting, uh, sale of businesses, and so it's it's all, it's not lateral is what I'm saying. It's very, um, it's all the names that you think people would recognise your company or industry as. And uh, the beauty of uh, search engine optimization search engine, engine optimization <laughs> is, uh, is that you don't have to compete where you're going to lose. <laughs> you want to compete where you're going to win. And you can, but you just have to think a little bit that way. So is, this, is that what they refer to as um, something about tail? Long tail? Long tail. Yeah, essentially, yes. Yes. It's about looking for niche keywords.